What is up? We are back. It's Wu Tang Wednesday. Oh my god, it's episode five, I think. I'm gonna need my second hand for the next episode. With me is a good friend of mine. I'm here with Max, aka the Rogue Theory, aka hand me the fattest stack of absolute garbage cards, and I'm gonna craft something to steal your lunch money, aka top 50 in the Vegas calling on Prism. When no one was touching that hero with a 10 foot pole. You probably read one of his five articles on the Wrath Times. He is Lord of the Jank, Master of the Homebrew, the deck building bully himself. Max, what's up, dude? It's good to be here. <laughs> uh, what's going on, man? What's For those that don't know you, I know this episode's going to be about um, something you're very good at. You are the local homebrew. You like to create decks that are very off-meta, and you like to take cards that... Maybe people don't look at as good, and you show up to these armories and these events, and that Vegas calling was super duper stacked. Let's start there. Like, how did you come to the call of bringing Prism to Vegas, and then how did you do so well on something like that? Like, what, like, what was that about? So, uh, the main premise and the original reason why I ended up deciding Prism was a good call is one, there's a fear factor. There's a fear factor of, this deck is X amount of rounds into Swiss, and it's winning. Um, my next round opponent, say, like, when I went in, like, round five, round six, first one, two rounds, they're like, oh, Prism won. No skill, no fear, no, maybe they break the opponent, you know, they didn't know how to play this matchup. And to be fair, no one did at the time. Um, I use, essentially, for my premise of deck building, and the reason why I said Prism was the choice for me for the LA uh, Vegas calling for, because I didn't make into nationals itself, uh, is because if someone doesn't have practice into it, their play lines, their decisions they make, there's a lot more room for error. And because I have all the practice, essentially, I have a lot more ability to win, to win out. And the <laughs> the the terrifying fear of a Lexi player uh, at that time when Lexi was the queen of aggro and just seeing her go, uh, one of them, uh, round six or seven opponent Lexi did Ardivor, Art of War, Rain Racers, Three Oak, and I then said on Three Oak, Arc Light Sentinel. And just the immediate <laughs> blowout was amazing. For those who aren't familiar, because again, Prism is not very... I mean, Prism just did well, like, very recently, and I'm maybe... But this is like, Prism got some new love in the new, the new stuff that just came out. When you were on Prism... Um, well, for those who don't know, the Arc Light Sentinel card pretty much stops your entire play. I play Katsu. I played against Max all the time. He doesn't brew decks that specifically make me want to flip the table, but every time I play against him, that's how I feel like I want, that's what I want to do is flip the table over. Um, but yeah, people are on Prism now. When when Max brought Prism to to Vegas, how, you were what one of how many Prisms of like the whole weekend, including Nats. Uh. I was one out of, so if we count nationals, right? If I had entered, I would have been one out of four. Unfortunately, didn't make my nationals invite. Um, but in calling overall, all the prisms had dropped from nationals and gone into the calling. Um, I was the only prism to make day two out of, I believe, seven total prisms in the room. Uh, they had, there was a lot of them asking me questions about them. Like, I would love to give you the information, but at this time, I'm um, in day two. I got to keep it secret. We're going to get to that because I think one of the biggest things is um, I play decks that are very, I guess, popular. Like when I first started playing Flesh and Blood, I had no problem like net decking a deck and, and grabbing it and then kind of like making a couple card, um, changing out a couple cards that might be different that might have felt good for me. But you end up coming up with these like completely off the wall ideas that end up doing very well and not all of them right like i'm sure sometimes you build something and you're like oh this isn't gonna work but it's just interesting to me because you said earlier the amount of practice that you get and your opponent doesn't get that that much practice i know a lot of people that are going to be listening to this locally and not some people aren't like me don't mind being a sweat lord and net decking or whatever but how do you how are you able to practice the list without getting some of that secret sauce out there like when you come up with a list and you don't know, don't give him, don't give any secret sauce no, now. We're in RTN good. season. You know what I mean? Like keep it to you. But like, what's that process like? How do you end up knowing like, oh shit, I could show up to uh, an event and do well with this when like you kind of have to keep some of that under wraps. 
So one of the most important things, at least for any deck that I've ever built at any time and period, um, it starts very simply. Um, I'm usually bored of what exists currently in the format. Everyone is has a set mindset about how something is done, how something is played. Um, so I look to take advantage and monopolize on that factor. And to also uh, follow back to your second episode of Blood Rush uh, with Wes uh, in regards to judging, uh, I build every deck with the intention of breaking the rules because they're not well designed sometimes. Spectra uh, for Prism, for example, which stops your entire action. You don't have go again. The attack never resolves. Um, it's one of the most strong keywords ever existed. And there was room to abuse it. Um, but the way to essentially get that practice, to get that understanding and development of a deck and not let it out there into the world, it's very challenging. Um, and it requires, one, uh, being able to play the deck against yourself. Um, so being able to test necessarily um, two hands, join up in a private Talishar room is one of the ways you can do it. Um, you can test against friends that you trust. Um, but to quote Ben Franklin, uh, the best secret is one between uh, where the other person is dead. Um, so, <laughs> so that's interesting. I, I, never, I never thought about playing yourself. So when you're in like a lobby, you'll just... Like you'll uh, just I was like, joined with another browser, which is just an incognito browser um, that I have set up with all decks of all meta formats. I run through a gauntlet with myself. Um, I've done this so often, actually, that I play games in my own sleep. Like, I'm not even joking. I dream and I play games. Like when you play too much uh, Tetris, you, it's like all you can see. Like, he's going back yes. and forth. <laughs> yes, I, I played. That's how I created the blue or iris Dromai um, originally. Uh, was just I was sleeping one night and I was just thinking about the old him and just feeling pure anger <laughs> that I can't play Katsu into him uh, at all. Not at the time. Uh, just too many blocks, too much uh, easy negation of damage. And uh, it just came to me. It's just like, look at Iris. Um, but the main, the main point of how you come up with anything um, or any um, concept and how you test it is look at the cards uh, valued on TCG Player. I sort by low to high instead of high to low. Um, because every card at any point of development or creation is intended with it to have some kind of impact towards a format, whether that be Blitz or CC. I don't consider Blitz a real format, to be fair. Um, there's something there to be used, and then they're later on abused because as more support comes out, they can't test for everything that exists previously. And there's always going to be something that slips through the cracks and allows you to build a very strong and impactful deck. So you will look at cards that maybe people like forgot about and then like see how they can interact with some of the newer stuff that comes out? Exactly. Um, like one of the biggest, uh, I think, shit-eating grin moments I've ever had. Apologies for swearing. I don't know if I'm lying. No, you're good. Yeah, say whatever you want. <laughs> um, one of the biggest shit-eating grin moments I ever had was playing against... Um, Team Ascents, Michael Lau. Um, and very RGN good player. Season. Yeah, very good player. Uh, and me throwing trade in from Arsenal, um, choosing to mandatorily discard Beast with it. And while we have Beat Chess now, which allows you to choose what you discard, um, we didn't have that at the time. So it was a completely different interaction than what they were used to. Um, the fact that I was able to discard Beast within, get the extra Intimidate as Reinar. Um, I remember him picking up the card, looking at it, reading the card, putting it down, looking at it again, <laughs> putting it down one more time. And I said, come on, come on, Mike. You've played this card. I know you've played it in draft before. Not you can't that tell way, me you haven't yeah. seen this card. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's just a little bit of like, also like that sort of mentality of like, you know, shit talking, quote unquote, that gets into someone's head. That's another whole point of the rogue philosophy and ideal. When you build a deck, um, people... Sometimes, I'm not saying to Mike or anyone locally, but some people don't believe they should be losing to a certain deck. And that just sends them further on tilt. Very psychologically built. Uh, and I'm a bit of an ass because that's what I do when I make decks. Well, you've said a lot of things. Sorry, when I'm typing, I'm taking notes. So if you just hear yeah, clacking, clacking, it's because, it's because one, I, I wanted Max to be on this, this show for, for a while now. And I remember when it, it was like in its infancy, I was like, dude, I have to have you on to talk about this stuff. Because my favorite episodes that I like to do, like the one that you mentioned about Wes, are like the ones where I selfishly want to ask you questions because you're very good at what you do. 
And I didn't even understand the layers to it until like we're diving in now because you can give out some of the secret sauce and like you have a very, very good game knowledge and rule knowledge to be able to abuse those things. So even if someone like is taking notes and they're like, okay, I'm going to play against myself. I'm going to sort the cards from, you know, um, lowest use to highest use or whatever. You still need all of the other things that are going on in your brain to be able to like put this together for those who don't know michael i was an, he's a very good player so like and i can i can imagine being at that table i think like psychological warfare in a card game where you're sitting across from your opponent is like so big and you see me play like if i'm at an armory it's like all laughs and everything if you sit across from me at an event like I have no sleeves on. I'm staring through your soul. There's a reason. I used to fight Muay Thai and stuff. So to sit across from something, that's not intimidating to me. But, like, I, I'm i part of that, like, thought of you want to have as much advantage going into the game. And I can see how, like, if you're on prism and someone's like, oh, this guy's on prism. I'm going to blow him out. And all of a sudden the health starts to, like, they're like, oh, I'm not going to lose this guy. Oh, wait. It's getting close. Wait. Oh, I can't lose to this. I'm not supposed to lose to this. And you, it just comes like a part at the seams. Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty interesting. Um, and I remember going against one of your Reinar decks that like you never rolled the dice. You're always you have this approach where whenever you show up on a hero, I'm like, oh, it's not gonna do what the hero is supposed to do. Um, how do you decide what hero you're gonna do? Because um, I know sometimes you have concepts that are. Like, you're not, you don't stay on one hero or one class. I've seen you mm -hmm. bounce around. You've beaten me on Riptide. You've beaten me on Prism. You've beaten me on that Reinar jank list. You have, you, is it just what the cards tell you to do? Is it what the meta, are you answering the meta? Or are you more going in like, I'm, regardless of what the meta is, I'm going to bring a deck that you're not going to know how to deal with instead of like you bringing a deck that's dealing with the meta. Does that make sense? Uh, no, it makes sense. Uh, that's a very loaded question. I'll answer it in like three technical parts. Um, when I first built uh, what's, I think, one of the most infamous rogue decks ever, I uh, ever built. Um, and again, hindsight, I never looked back at it because I thought it was boring and I didn't want to play because I couldn't do what it was intended originally designed for, which is um, our Nationals winning deck in US Nationals was, uh, it was Fatigue Briar. Um, that list is identical to the exact list that I brought to my original Nationals, which uh, I ended up losing out to bad judge calls, but that is what it is. Um, uh, God, Channel Fireball, when it first started, was not good at running events, and neither were their judges. Um, <laughs> that is why I became a judge, was because there was a lot of incorrect rulings going on at the beginning of the game. Um, but that was a reverse stack prior that was looking to do... Record was 372 damage in one turn, um, that I did in U.S. Nationals. And I remember six judges being there because at the time, um, rule set was that you had to finish out the entire combat chain like uh, before you calculate damage before someone's actually able to lose the game, quote unquote. Otherwise, they concede and drop from the entire tournament. That was the original rule set. And I did this just because I wanted to fuck with people. I wanted to throw the massive biggest damage turn anyone's ever seen in their life. Wait, uh, re oh, wait, hold on, before we move on. So you yeah. did three, you presented 372 in one turn? One turn, yeah, one exact turn. How late into the game was this? Oh, like, I mean, it was when I hit my cycle, but, like, that's, like... 307, I'm so happy I wasn't around for this. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you're, you're good. I, I wish I could show it to you, um, and I wish I could play it in LL, but they uh, tree reverted the original they changed the interaction with spectra so that viscerai had a chance into prism where he could stack rune chance originally and hit spectra and still retain the rune chance they reverted that back to the previous older ruling because it just makes some more sense simpler that when you swing with a weapon into a spectra that the rune chance do pop previously that was not the correct interaction um it was supposed to retain and keep up but due to a bad judge ruling um that decks uh wasn't able to top and unfortunately, it's no longer playable in LL because you have to deal with Prism now. Um, but the whole point was Skeleta is a bad card. Uh, Sonata Arcanix was prime for you to just abuse because reduces by X rune chance. So very strong, very strong. Are you infamous with the judges? Uh, at that time, I was uh, because I definitely got in their faces. <laughs> and I probably should have been banned for some of the language I used. But I would just imagine like if I'm a judge... 
and I see you walk in, I'm like, oh, shit. I better know what, like, when I call a judge over, it is the simplest of questions. It is, like, a very simple interaction. There's not many crazy things that my deck's doing. I would imagine that, like, yeah, if I was a judge and I saw you, I'd be like, oh, shit. I better, like, have the rule book handy because you're just going to push that boundary. Yes, yes. And uh, that was another one of the um, interesting points. Um, we actually had to do, there was a hot fix to the conference of rules that occurred um, because of something that I complained about with uh, Ball Lightning that existed originally and also one of the reasons I originally got banned um, is because the interaction with Ball Lightning, for anyone who knows it's a banned card for a very good reason, um, is because it uh, how priority of effects works. If Arcane is attempting to occur, you are able to choose the priority order that it resolves in. Um, that your ball lightning damage of arcane will bump it by one before they can even null rune it out. Um, by that logic and originally how rules were written, um, your opponent could order the prism player to use null rune as their last use of prevention and spectral shields as their first, consuming spectral shields before they ever arcane block, um, which was an incredibly stupid, inaccurate way to play the game. Um, and it was a whole thing, but... But like, very, I, feel, very well. I feel like you'd have to get used to this, right? Because if you're successful with doing what you're doing, hmm. you're going to poke a hole in, in like the verbiage of the rules that LSS, LSS has presented, right? So yeah. like, I would imagine that a victory for you is like winning an event and then them making like the rogue theory, ad like addendum to the, you know what I mean? To the rule where it's like, oh shit, like... Yeah, it was a rule, and he didn't cheat, but the rule wasn't specific enough, so now we have to change that. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's similar to you, which happened originally, that uh, the rules never say that you're not allowed to not have your sideboard. <laughs> That's what happened with you when you went uh, to your calling. Yeah, for those who don't know, I went to the calling, and it was one of the side events, and uh, I had draft. It was sealed. So it wasn't even draft. It was sealed. The top eight cut to a draft. And um, all the cards that I didn't want to use in my sealed pool, I threw out. And then I got a deck check, and the judge came over, and they were like, can we have your deck? And I was like, here's my deck. And they were like, what are the other cards? And I was like, they're in that trash can right over there. And they were like, why would you do that? And I was like, well, I don't want any more bulk. We're in, I think that was, was that, it was either was LA Dallas. or Dallas. Yeah, or no, 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 Dallas. Uh, Vegas, sorry, Vegas or Dallas. Right. Okay. Oh, it was Dallas, because Tuck won that event. It was Dallas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the judges all looked at me like, uh, we've never seen this before. And I was like, well, they just came and gave me like a warning. Your, your way of pushing the rules is way cooler than me throwing my cards out and them getting mad that I threw out my bulk. I just want cards to get banned. That's <laughs> legitimately, I wanted Skeleton to get banned. I wanted Sonata to get banned. I wanted all of Briar to get banned. So that's why I built that deck. Um, granted, I built that off of three nights without sleep, and that was not the best decision because, like, oh, man, it was so optimized by the end of its lifetime, um, especially with Nationals. That, that even optimized it even further than I could have imagined. But, um, like, every deck that I built, um, to get back to the original point of your question, every deck that I built... Um, one, it's to, one, get something banned, because I hate it. I think it's stupid. It <laughs> um, two is yes to counter a format that it currently is the setup. It's the setup expectation of what that deck is supposed to do, how it's supposed to play. Countering that alone means your opponent missed sideboards into you. Uh, having a Reinar um, pitch three, uh, what was it? At the time, they had to pitch uh, Fate for Scene into a Blood Rush Bellow, and they hit their other Fate for Scene, because I hadn't swung the entire game as Briar at all into them. Um, and just them originally learning fates, sinks, to stop my overall damage of regular Briar and Ball. And I'm like, I, I'm not swinging on you. And um, blowing them out with that amount of damages. It's very rewarding. But with that said, I also build every deck that I present for a format. I actually already have built the counter to. So I actually have a few rogue decks that I have in the woodworks that, like, when I originally built the Iris Dromai, um, Okay, that list uh, lost to uh, trading in Reinar with trade in, discarding, the extra intimidate, it wasn't able to give up. And if people switched into trade in Reinar, the Prism list took advantage of that because it made it have to gamble more than it needs to, it ends up losing, so on and so forth. Um, current list that I'm on right now is, I actually believe, and I'll say it, 
um, so everyone has an understanding of it. It's Riptide. I think it's one of the uh, best contenders oh, right no. now. Um, it loses very badly into Guardian. You have to play that really perfectly, and your opponent has to make a lot of room for error, necessarily. Um, I have a list that beats the Guardian version, but I don't like it. Um, not in its current iteration, because it loses the Riptide version. However, I have a list of Katsu, which I think is probably the peak um, of what I have currently as a rogue deck. Uh, I'll send that to you, Dan, after RTN season. I, Hell I yeah. my calling one, to be fair. Hell uh, yeah. You're not going to like it. You're, you're not going to like it at all. <laughs> you, we've had the discussion about Ancestral Harmony. You do not believe it's a good card. I think that card's insane. No, I like I'm Harmony. Okay, break. I'm running Harmony. I love Harmony. I don't know why. But they, you're I not know. breaking the combat chain. I am. No, I'm not breaking the combat chain. <laughs> I'm not breaking the combat chain. Uh, yeah, your Riptide list is pretty good. For those who don't know, I had Dishonored Max at the last event on the Riptide list, and I still lost. It's pretty good. It's okay. It's it's, it's mildly good. okay. Uh, it's better now. It's better now. So, do you think? Are you creating the counters to your the decks that you're coming up with out of like boredom, out of just seeing like what is this deck bad against, or um, are you? Is it also like if people jump on the train where they're like, oh shit, that deck's good. You'd be like, yeah, it's great. Here you go, and then like you're on the thing that just you know that beats that up. Um. So. In this case where I stated, um, for example, right, that the Riptide list, it's great. It has really good favorable matchups. Um, it can just auto win into a lot of things, um, but it loses the Guardian. It's the fact that uh, people will make a shift over to combat that deck and that strategy. It's only good for a set amount of time. Once someone knows the gimmick, um, it becomes much weaker as an overall whole. Um, what I do to counterplay that understanding, that matchup knowledge that they've changed for and learned for is I present something which is entirely the opposite direction, which takes advantage of them making changes in their list. Um, I guess what I'm really doing is not really making the deck that beats that list, but makes the deck that beats the list that I just built. Uh, um, so you're just one step ahead of it. So like if I, and I, I learned my lesson, Max, you know this, I'm not teching against you, man, because it's just, <laughs> I'm just gonna lose anyway. But like, if I were one of those guys, I understand now because like I'll play against that list and I'd be like, oh, you know what? I only lost, and I don't say silly shit like this. I know you're very good at what you're doing, but I won't be. Oh, the only reason I lost that is because it's the first time I saw it. If I played against it again, I can make the adjustments. Now, when I go to make the adjustments, you're, I'm getting got because you're you're one step ahead of me, like anticipating those adjustments. I mean, even if we chose to run back, I think that uh, that game you played against Riptide, um, I think that game pretty much ends up relatively the same, pretty consistently over around the board. Um, I think any changes you would attempt to make with Ancestral Harmony now into it, um, I think it's scarier. Um, I definitely think that's a scarier matchup, but I don't think it's beneficial to you as much because now you're you're including a card that gives plus one to all your attacks, and that just turns on every trap that is available to me. So. Yeah. It's um, it's interesting because you're in this position where your skill set and knowledge of the game allows you to do something witty like this, and then it puts like I'm gonna have an, uh, a podcast on like teching for the local meta, and I because I, there's like two completely different schools of thought on it, and I don't think one is right or wrong. I think it depends what you want out of the game. It depends the kind of event that you're showing up for. It a lot of it depends, right? It depends. Yeah. Do you want to win the army or whatever? But with you specifically, it's just like, even if I thought I could tech against your lists, I'm now probably losing to the rest of the actual meta. So mm -hmm. I have come to terms with, which is crazy because I'm super competitive and I never want to just like, People were like, oh, you know what, uh, you know, you, you're, we're bringing Bravo, we're just going to dodge the Kano, or, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. they want to dodge a hero, I'm like, well, I'm not teching against Max, because if I do that, then my, my deck sucks against everything else, so I have to just chalk it up to, like, <laughs> if we fair, I'm just going to, I'm just going to yeah. let Jesus take the wheel, and I'm going to try my best. But it's cool, because you're in this position, like I said, where, like, people can't really tech against you. One, they don't know what you're bringing, two... If they're teching against something that you're bringing and they're not teching against like what the actual meta is. Um, it's fun to watch you do this at the local level, but then it's more fun because when we travel, I'm rooting for you. You know what I mean? When you're up against me, I'm not rooting for you. But when we travel, it's like, yo, Springs versus the world. It's real cool to see you take these ideas from locally where 
The Springs meta is not very, it's not a very good representation of what the actual meta is. And I feel like most armories and stuff are like that. Flesh and Blood is kind of like a game where you want to play the hero that you want to play. Um, and then you show up to a big event and you're like, what the fuck? Like, all these guardians out of nowhere. And if you're, I mean, Katsu is like great because it's a big skill check, right? Like, I can yeah. tell right away. When I'm playing someone at one of these events, if they have good Katsu sparring partners in their locals, and if they don't, then it's like, the last event that I went to, someone, I played Bonds of Ancestry, and he turned the card over and read it, and I was like, oh no, oh my god, you are so fucked that you don't know what this card is, <laughs> you know what I mean, like, like I'm so sorry, you clearly don't play any, against any Katsu players, but you brought up another good point, and it's like, the sideboarding, I always think that like, it's, it must be nice to be on one of these heroes that's like Dash or Dorinthia, right? Dorinthia, they can show up and you could put in all these D-Rex, think it's a Dumbla, and they're like, oh, I'm on Decimator, gotcha, bitch. Or yeah. Dash, where you don't know if it's going to be Tank Dash or full aggro, boost, 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 and you don't know until yeah. you see it. But you do this with heroes that are like much less obvious. Like yes, you'll show much more with, linear yeah. deck building. Much more yeah, different. you'll show up with like a Reinar that's not intimidating at all, or you know what I mean? Like you kind of always do the opposite of what the hero wants to do, and especially in a format where you're going to be playing against someone once and probably never see them again. By the time they even realize what your deck is doing, it is way too late. It is way too mm -hmm. late. Um, and, and I and you're right to the point that I only see them once, essentially, um, for the most part. Um, and even if they see me again, I'm on something else. So it doesn't really help give them knowledge into the next game into me. Um, and I, I do this specifically because I don't believe that everyone wants to win. Sure, I'd love to take down a call-in. I'd love to take down call-in uh, Los Angeles coming up. Um, I don't play to win a call-in. I don't play to day two. If I wanted to day two, I can play the best deck in the room. I can play a KO, I can play a Kasai, I can play a Bravo. Um, if I want to make top eight, your better conversion rates, if you look across the board out of all participants that ever participate in any tournament, your best conversion rates are actually with the lowest played hero at the format in time because no one knows how to play against them. No one has a sideboard for them. And those players are playing very optimized decks to attempt to take advantage of people's inability to play against them, their advanced knowledge into every other matchup. And more importantly, when it comes down to top eight, you don't have an ability, even if you have a game plan knowing how to side, of how to counter them. All I do is I build decks to top eight. I don't build decks to win. That's interesting because if you look at like some of the... Um... Like that was one of the things that they said the re the recent prison that just did really well. They said that like that that prison player caught like lightning in a bottle. Like almost like when Dash IO, everyone was like that this deck is ass cheeks, and then showed up to one of the I think it was a calling. And mm -hmm. and went undefeated in Swiss and only lost the game in the finals against Duazuri. You watch things like that because if you look at like Dash now, Dash IO has some very, very bad matchups. You'd be a f psychopath to bring Dash IO when Bravo is S tier and it's just, it's like that matchup is so difficult. But at that calling, no one knew how to play, like no one knew how to play against it. Um, you take that to a different level because the Dash IO list, the Prism list that we saw was very, um, it was standard for what the hero wants to do. It's just a hero that we don't really see. And you're able to do it to like a, the next level. And it's, uh, Dude, it's fun to watch. It is so aggravating to play against them, but my god, it is fun to watch. Max is like, for those who have never gotten the pleasure or displeasure of playing against Max, Max is like the first guy I'll buy a beer for when we go, you know what I mean? We went to Red Robin after that one event. Like, I love breaking bread with Max and I love asking him questions, but when I'm at even an armory and I see his name pop up, I'm like, oh fuck. Like, why can't it just be a normal game? <laughs> You take, you take like, you are very good at making your opponent play your game. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it works, man. It's pretty effective. I wish I was, uh, I wish I was able to do, I get nervous when I'm taking a card or two out of like a winning list. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if like what I'm doing is good or not, but 
I think it's pretty simple. Um, like here, I'll give you a short exercise. So everyone else who's listening can also do that. Hell yeah, I'm taking um, you hear me typing now. <laughs> I have an answer for what I believe is the best rogue version of Katsu. I think it's the one that wins out majority of the games here. I think you don't even lose it to KO. I don't think it's possible, actually. With that said, I want you to think of a majestic card. Think about the card. How much do you think it's worth the card that I'm looking to possibly play? Me, because I know you, it's dirt cheap. Because yeah. I know you, it's not an expensive card. It's something that no one's playing. It's something that people aren't... It's probably something that people aren't even aware of. That you played a Riptide card? Oh my god, what is the name of it? Where... Oh my, what? I'm gonna need more details, colors. It did it's something bad. with like my uh, arsenal. It had like arsenal, I think, disruption. Oh, inertia trap. Yeah. Was it inertia trap? Yeah, inertia trap. It gives you an inertia when you have attack value greater than its base. Very common for. Cards. No, it wasn't. It was an attack action card that you were playing, and every time you played it, it got me about. It made me not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of outside of CNC, Death Touch, Codex. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was an Arsenal disruption. It was a card that I have never seen before, and you played it. Oh, yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, Battering Bolt. Battering Bolt. No one plays in a Dakotsu. I have it's never seen this card bad. before, and like yeah. I'm sure people listen. They're like, "Oh, Dan, come on! I know what that card does." The amount of times that I have to turn over a card that you play, mm. and you'll start, <laughs> you'll already start explaining what the card does because you know i have no fucking idea what the card does <laughs> the amount of times i get got my cards that i'm like holy shit like, this card seems good but it's not really good it's good because you made it good uh, yes uh and for anyone uh, listening and uh, for the reason why battering bolts traditionally not played in the katsu is because it's not aggressive it's not doing enough disruption however when you're playing a, into a game where katsu has to do kadachi kadachi essentially into you to whittle you down and isn't able to get really full tempo just because uh, Riptide's uh, massive control ability through trap damage and through trap effects. Battering Bolt allows you at a certain lineup when you're counting his stack of cards, because that's the other important thing is in this matchup, he's not shuffling. You can reverse stack his deck for your advantage. Um, you get to threaten in uh, removing a blue card from his hand, um, like visit the Flying Dojo, or also his Ancestral Empowerments. You just get to line it up in your advantage. Um, and so you back to that M thing that when you were talking about this this exercise is that how you're you're going from you're not going you're going to the cheapest cards. I'm yeah, I'm going one of the cheapest cards. Um, I will give you a hint. It does the exact same thing another card already does. Um, that uh, about not every ninja player plays it, but they did originally. So it does the exact same text as take the tempo. But I doubt you know that. I don't even know. I know take the tempo. One for five. If it's the three or more, you can banish yeah. a card and play it. Yeah. And well, specifically take the tempo says attack action cards. This yeah. one says any card. Does not matter. You can play it until the end of your next turn. I have no idea. And so that's going to be Break Tide. Um, Break Tide is part of the Flood the Forest, Rushing River, Torrent of Tempo line. Torrent of Tempo needs to hit. Sure. Your opponent's going to block it out with two cards. That's phenomenal. Why Why are you not wanting Reinar or Ko to block with two cards in this format when he can just do such high damage value turns, um, which are overrate because of his go again, because the one thing that Brutes always lacked is go again. So uh, essentially a line that focuses on your opponent being incentivized to block, sort of like how the whole Dory matchup works, is the reason that you're able to go tempo swinging into... Um, uh, Ko currently as Dory, just mimicking the concept that Dory's doing, switching it over to Katsu. Like that's my current Katsu iteration, is that entire belief, design, philosophy. And because if they block it out, you get to arsenal one of your powerful cards, Ancestral Harmony. You get to do a lot better um, lines in the sense of banishing cards from the top of your deck, from your arsenal, not really losing value there, getting actual true value out of your arsenal, rather than getting stuck a combo card or putting in a starter card that's susceptible to CNC or send packing. It's just my opinion. It's probably the new Katsu. That's an interesting thought, though, because it's like my, that's like what, you know, Katsu 101, the response to that is, well, it has to hit. And you're like, well, fine. Like, yeah, I, I can take advantage of the fact that it has to hit and then now you have to block. And then once they're like, you know what? What's the worst that's going to happen? Let me let this shit hit. <laughs> that's when you just run away with it. Uh, 
highest damage I did, and I did this previously, um, when old him, the little minimalism Vi, and uh, I wish Stubby Hammers was still around. Oh, God. I played that. Um, I played against Dylan. We had Dylan on an episode or two ago. Uh, Williamson teammate Dylan. When we yes. had LL night and everyone else was on Starvo, he brought in Stubby's Belittle Fi and he played two Art of Wars with Stubby's. And I was like, well, this is not. This. You had a really good time. I did not. And I was, <laughs> by the way, because of my ego, yeah. I was on CC Legal Katsu at the time. <laughs> I get it. Like, I really get it. Uh, LL is not the format for me, um, personally. Um, I think it's a little too much for me to tackle in a way that I can build something competitively. Um, and I build everything competitively. Even if it's rogue, it's still competitive. Um, I still remember Wes and his sort of, like, higher pitch sort of, like, com complain, scream of, like, man, it's not even rogue. This is fucking meta. Well, that's uh, the thing is I hate to use yeah sabers. I hate to use the term jank when it comes to you because jank is usually like oh I'm gonna put together this deck and it's like I'm gonna beat one person and everyone's gonna see the cool thing but I'm gonna lose like seven while I'm trying to do that you do build you build very cohesive decks that are very successful and I'm sure not all of them are like that's just part of the process I'm sure when you test it's not like everything you build is just like amazing but when you're able to fine tune it and stuff like yeah, it's not, I hate, it's like, it's jank in the terms of like, you probably haven't seen any of these cards. The entire deck is probably $30. Like, you know what I mean? But like, but it, you, you're very good at what you do, man. You're so good at what you do that, like I said, I have come to terms with like, I am not teching against Max because I, one, it might not even work. And then two, I'm just going to lose to everything else. Um, it's, it's really interesting how you, how you put these lists together. So you're... This will come out next. Those who don't know, it's not actually Wednesday right now. But this is going to come out next. Our calendar, so me and you right now, present day, is going to come out next Wednesday. So there would have already been one weekend of RTN. So you think you're on Riptide for the RTNs. Do you know what you're going to be on? I know you're going to LA. Do you know what you're going to be on in LA? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Riptide is probably my, my LA deck. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I will say probably for RTN, I might play concert. I mean, I need to source the cards. I'm missing a mask of momentum. Right, I got you, bro. I'm on Lynx now. I got you. You can borrow my mouse. Okay. I only okay, use, okay. It, use it against Illusionists now. You're going to probably regret that. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to go round one, two, and three, and then I'm going to see you, and you're going to beat me with my own mask of momentum. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that'd be hilarious. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I'm also debating Kano right now for RTN season. Um, Kano. Uh, Kano, yeah. Kano. This is interesting, because I know the version of Kano you're on is not a... Is and it just also so that's one of the other beauties of like playing a rogue deck, right? Uh, and being the guy who always plays rogue decks. Um, and a local scene where it's, um, and, and for anyone listening who ever wants to build any kind of decks, um, feel free to do so. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, you're going to lose a lot of games. Um, there's no secret sauce to it. Uh, losing is just part of the natural flow of the game, and you have to accept it. Um, a lot of RT or not a, a lot of armies that I go to. I probably lose like the first two rounds. I drop because one, I'm not in pricing. I don't necessarily need to play. But the amount of knowledge I get out of my losses is incredible because I don't just play necessarily one game into my opponent, one list into my opponent. Um, when I am playing uh, into my opponent, um, it helps to have like all these decks that aren't brewing in my back of my head because I am evaluating not only my hand I'm playing here, what they're throwing then, but if I had literally the other deck and the other cards. Uh, at all times, at all times. Um, I've been, so I've, these yeah, yeah. Uh, help you win. They really help you win. Um, I've lost way more than I've ever won. Um, the only way that you end up winning at any big event, any tournament you go to, is sitting down and saying, I'm going to get the shit kicked out of my teeth over and over and over again. My Kano, um, like I'm saying, like I can bring normal Kano. You're not going to think it's normal Kano. You're not going to know it's normal Kano. And I could literally bring normal prism if I wanted to. <laughs> You'd still be terrified on a local level and so forth. If you establish yourself as the guy who loses, who plays rogue, who then wins occasionally with rogue, everyone's like, it's going to be some jank. I'm not going to necessarily sideboard anything. And you can get Bebot as well for that. I will state I'm probably playing more normal Kano. Um, I will say the new card has incentivized me to play Kano because it returns me back to an old school line of thought 
when I originally played Kano before the release of Monarch, during Crucible format, uh, before we had ever had Aether Wildfire combos, you had to play a mid-range version of him. You had to tempo, you had to do a lot of... There wasn't really this huge concept of reverse stacking. We ran a garbage card called Forked Lightning. God, it's so terrible. Oh, it's awful. Um, it's so bad compared to the cards we have now. It's just but, so interesting that you even said that because I know a lot of the Kano players weren't hyped up on the new card. So, of course, Max would be like, that new card's what got me to play Kano. And all the Kano players are like, yo, what the fuck is this blue card? <laughs> uh, it just lets you play a great mid-range. And I think that's something that's really fun to do and engaging. Um, because even a mid-range Kano is spooky because you still have access to the Lava Flare combo. And I don't know, like everything's up in the air. I could flip a coin the day of and decide uh, I've brought Kano, I watched a bunch of people write Null Rune in their deck list and I'm gonna remove this to the side. They have three less cards against whatever I play. Yeah, it must be nice, dude. It must be nice. Everybody knows, everybody and their mother knows what I'm bringing when I go to these events. It must be real nice, dude. <laughs> I, I mean, I can give you the ripples, I don't care. No, I mean it's it's one of those things that like in the off season I always will practice some other uh, some other stuff. I think it just makes you a better flesh and blood player. And obviously, like oh, yeah. you echo a lot of the things that Wes said, where um, a lot of the reason why not a lot of the reason a part of the reason that you're as good as you are is because of your vast knowledge of the rules. And on that episode, we talked about like if becoming a judge is like make you a better player. And I mean, you're proving it right here, right? You have oh, to know the rules to be able to take advantage of them. 100%. Like, um, I would never have played Prism if I was not a judge and did not was not aware that Parable of Humility stopped Lexi from doing anything. Um, I also would not have, like, been a good enough Dromai player originally when she released and realized Nourishing Emptiness was a great card and played Nourishing Dromai. Um, a majority of mistakes that I see Dromai's players make is they swing Kyloria at the opponent um, and they are having a sigil in hand. They play it um, originally before they swing, or they play it as an instant when it's swung, um, because that still gives someone a de-react uh, attempt. You actually should swing the Kyloria, presenting just an on-hit. Um, do your draw in the resolution step, activate sigil. Because now it has go again in the link step, uh, and it's a step that no one's ever heard of for the most part. Yeah, like even that is pretty tricky. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. You said... Um, because now it has go again. Yeah, yeah. You said something before that I want to echo. I think it's something that um, players, especially in a game of flesh and blood where it's very skill based, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of players are chasing like their first armory win. I don't even mean winning an actual armory. I mean winning a game at an armory. Mm -hmm. uh, the newer players will always chase that. And then um, sometimes people get discouraged or whatever. But you said it, and I love this. There's this saying, I don't know who the fuck said it. He's smarter than me. Um, a master at something has lost more than you've played altogether. Mm -hmm. So a true master at something has lost more flesh and blood games than you have total logged completely. And uh, it's one of those things that I pride myself on. Um, it's so nice to hear other people open up about that because I feel like most times people aren't honest about that. Um, so I should add to that because you reminded me before I forget. Um, like Prism, like joke deck has a terrible win rate everyone knew she had an awful win rate new prism uh into the calling uh season um or the national season um i had been intentionally punting her since day one for about three to three months intentionally losing every single game on talishar skew just those stats <laughs> just playing it out making it seem like it was semi-close on her side but she was just struggling just no i i knew how to play it i was gaining information while losing the entire time just controlled bird um so yeah, you will lose a lot more if you want to be rogue because you'll trick people into thinking it's garbage. <laughs> I just and think also like just losing lose. in general is like the best way to learn. People like want to win and they look at these decks that have like insane win rates on Talishar and stuff. And it's like one, if you're looking at a deck that has like an 85% win rate over hundreds of games, something's fucking wrong. Like, honestly, this is card. They're probably playing me. Yeah. <laughs> Or they're playing each th themselves. They got incognito mode up, and there, there's no way it, if a deck like that. I mean, Lexi at the highest of her oppression was like, I think a sixty or sixty like three percent win rate into everything, and that's like when people see that, like 
you know, people that know card games, they're like, holy shit, that's fucked up. That's very good. So to see something like these, these deck, these deck lists pop up on someone's like, you got, you see this new 80% win rate over 300 games on, you know, X, Y, and Z hero. It's like, that's not, that's yeah. not it. But that's also like not what we should be chasing. If you're trying to improve at the game of flesh and blood, like you should want to lose. If you want, if you go into an army and you're stomping everyone out, you're not really learning anything. You need, probably need better sparring partners. And um, from someone who's beaten my ass multiple times to hear you say that, like, learn, uh, losing is part of the process makes me feel better about. Because it's part of my process, too. I, I tell everyone if they're, like, you know, if they were to ask me, like, what a, one, a, one of my best skills is, I always say, like, I'm a very good loser. Like, I, I, I'm good at, like, losing and then, like, making that make me a better player. So, like, the more I, I kind of try to seek that out sometimes. So Yeah, no, I totally understand that. Um, I... Uh, and you've heard it, and everyone's probably heard it, probably to death. It's whatever I say whenever anyone uh, says that, like, ah, oh, it's just like this concept's good or whatever, or like, how well are you doing? I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'm X one or something like that. So it's just like, oh, you're doing well, and I'm like, no, I'm a terrible player. I am 100% a terrible player. Um, I'm not the greatest loser. Uh, I'm not like the most graceful in defeat. Like. When I lose, I, I hard sit. I hard sit, I think I replay the entire game from the beginning to the end. I analyze every mistake I do. And I make tons of mistakes. Oh, man, do I make mistakes. <laughs> but I love Crazy Brew. But I love Crazy Brew. Yeah. Yeah, not only Crazy Brewing decks. If you look at Max's binder, he has like 17 pages of the actual card Crazy Brew. I've seen it. It's amazing. It's one of the best beautiful cards I've ever created. I we're going to have to do a recap episode where we're going to... Um, maybe we do it after LA. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Because what I want to do is like, this was very macro, high level, how to go about the deck building process, have no fear, get ready to lose, the way that you evaluate cards and look at them, and also the mind tricks and like the advantage of showing up with something that people either will think it's something and it's not and then you they get got or they're just not used to seeing maybe the hero i would love to have you back to do like a deep dive on a list that you know no one's gonna play and we can like go not card for card but almost card like what were the ideas and putting this in and we can even get deeper but we can't give out the secret sauce now <laughs> uh, i think i'd be down to give out some of the secret sauces i have some failed ones some really bad failed ones like they're good they're just not yet good yeah like uh the katsu i'm saying like uh i've ran that deck at a previous event and as i said in the little minimals on five and it did phenomenal into him and it was on six blues and katsu at the time that is uh, like none that's like that's that none. that is that is abysmally none that's now none. i'm on nine that's much better it's still not <laughs> <laughs> but uh <laughs> you'll, you'll i'll send it over to you after our tn season i want you to at least rep it and see if you end up deciding if it's good enough I'm all right so by the that. time that deck has done its thing and it's run its course and it, it's it's claimed people when you're ready to go through the deep dive, that would be the best one because I play Katsu. So like, if you show me a prison deck, I'm gonna, it all is gonna look fucking foreign to me. But we do Katsu, and I'll be I'll be able to actually give input, and it'll be cool to like go over it from that level. Um, this was awesome, dude. I appreciate you so much, man. This is like you got me like excited to try new cards out and stuff like that. And and I think there's a lot of people. Again, locally in Springs, not locally, that like they don't want to just do what's been done. People want to pave their own path. And for every one rogue theory, there's like 15 Dan theories that like they just is a mess. But this is like a good insight to like it can work and you can do it, but you have to do it like the right way. And, and yeah, um, I admire how much work you put into these lists and, 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 and how you are able to test it in a closed environment because everyone knows a deck i'm bringing i can test it against whoever it makes the testing a lot easier um mm -hmm. i know you're going live with your youtube soon you have a team like uh let's do some shout outs before we before we end this okay well um shout out to team Overpitch. Uh, it's a current team that uh we're trying to at least get everything up and going for we'll try to probably do a podcast at some point definitely have to invite dan of course <laughs> my man with the katsu let's go um but otherwise, besides that, uh, yep, YouTube channel is going to be Rogue Theory. It's going to be the same as my gem uh, name that you'll see in pairings. Uh, if you get paired up against with me, it'll be a lovely shout-out to hear that you watched this episode. Uh, 
And hopefully it gets live soon. Been working a lot with the VTuber model and getting that all up and going. But um, I love Flesh and Blood. I've loved card games ever since I was a kid. Um, and I'll be honest, Riptide, uh, I just love saying to my opponents, draw your last pathetic card, Yugi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, next time, I'm telling you guys, if you go to an event and you see Rogue Theory, this is the move you do. You stand up, let me get further, and you go, oh, and you fucking fake a hamstring injury, and you hope that the judges repair that shit. <laughs> Max is great to share a table with, but man, it is frustrating when you go against him. But that's the whole thing, right? Like, that means you're doing a good job. I have to shout out Simon, because every time we mention the team name, every time I have talked about Simon on the past, he, he said, yo, every time you tell a story about me, it's me losing. Simon is one of the better <laughs> players. Simon is one of the best players in our local scene. And the only reason I talk about when I take one off of him is because how much I respect him as a player. But Simon, I'm sorry, man. We're not going to talk about you losing anymore. As a matter of fact, I think he beat Wes at the last armory. Which is one of my teammates. So suck it, Wes. Simon got you. Simon, my, my bad, dude. Yeah, but he didn't get come first. He wasn't undefeated at the end of the no, day. No, no. But see, no, we're not talking about that. So we're not talking about any more Simon. We already we're did. Not, we got to sneak it in there. We're not talking about Simon losing ever again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, Max, I appreciate you. I'm going to plug the YouTube is going to be in the uh, comments below when you guys are watching this. Uh, look out for the team. And again, you if you do see Rogue Theory pop up, one... Be a little nervous. But two, say what up. After he beats you at the table, he's like one of the nicest guys. But it is it is tough sharing the table with you, brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, and I fully understand. <laughs> Hell, yeah, dude. Well, I appreciate you, man. This is awesome. I appreciate you. And we're going to do a round two after uh, when we're allowed to uh, share the secret sauce. Okay. Uh, I right, look man. forward to it. See you guys.